environmental management is no walk in the park, especially here in the Caribbean. You're faced with incredibly complex issues, increasingly volatile conditions, and the near constant need to balance the often conflicting interests of local and regional stakeholders, such as governments, industries, and local communities. Naturally, this takes a lot of focus and dedication, but it also requires access to accurate data. And this is where research comes into play, along with the tools researchers use to keep track of important areas and variables of interest. Geographic Information Systems Mapping, or GIS Mapping for short, allows researchers to do this visually by representing important geospatial data on digital maps. It can be difficult for Caribbean researchers to reap the full benefits of its use, however, due to limitations in resources such as funding and trained personnel. Thankfully, some of our researchers are finding creative ways to circumvent these issues, and in the case of one particular marine biologist, doing so in a way that increases public involvement and raises the resolution of acquired data in the process. The name of that one particular marine biologist is Kim Baldwin, and we were lucky enough recently to get a hold of her for a great conversation about her work and her journey. It's the same approach I've been doing for the last 15 years. I've just refined it even more with using drone technology. So let's talk about how participatory research and technology can be combined to produce amazing results in this episode of Caesar Voices. There are some people in this world following career paths they've dreamt about since childhood. People who've always known they'd be doing what they're doing today. And then there's Dr. Kim Baldwin. So I didn't grow up as a kid wanting to be a marine biologist. It was something actually that just came out of default. Um, I did a first degree in, I'm a hardcore scientist. I was pre-med in biology. At university, my undergrad, I just kind of freaked out and realized I didn't want to be a doctor. I didn't want to be in the hospital. I didn't want to be inside. I didn't want to go to school for all these years. I just kind of had a meltdown. So I saw a counselor and she said, well, what are you, what are you passionate about? What do you love? And at that point in time, I just got into diving. I loved the ocean. I grew up in the water, on the beach, camping outdoors. I loved field work and science. I'd always loved field research. So I said, I really love those sorts of things. And she said, well, she looked at everything I did. And she said, well, if you stay an extra semester, you could switch your degree to marine biology. And you could maybe become like a park ranger or work outside doing field research. And I thought, well, perfect. Kim presents a solid example of the fact that you can absolutely change course if you don't like where you're going, as long as you're willing to put in the work. I wanted to travel around the world and do research in other countries. So in order to do that, you had to be a dive master and you had to be a lifeguard and you had to have first aid certifications to be doing these field jobs. So I just went and got every certification. I started volunteering at the local aquarium, cleaning fish tanks. So I had some sort of marine biology internship. And then I got a job, my first job working for um, Boston University in the Turks and Caicos Islands, the School for Field Studies as a research diving assistant. So I was a teaching assistant working in the field diving and teaching the students the fish and the corals and the, the reef IDs and, and doing reef surveys. So for me, this was like the dream job. And so I didn't know anything about the Caribbean. I didn't know anything about Turks and Caicos. But I was like, this is the opportunity I've been looking for. And within 30 days, I packed up my bags and I headed to the Caribbean. And long story short, that is where I fell in love with the region and the vibes, the environment, uh, marine biology, everything. That's where I just knew this, this was the right thing. So it was at this point that Kim started to really become acquainted with the GIS mapping process. Geography can mean more than you think. It's fighting climate change. It's challenging inequality. It's wildlife conservation. It's technology that makes a difference. 
It's knowing the world that we live in and changing it for the better. And GIS is what makes it happen. GIS, or Geographic Information Systems, is a technology that helps understand the world around us so we can build a better future for everyone. Let's hear from some of the people that actually use it. So because I was doing um, coral reef surveys, mangrove surveys, learning about marine mapping and monitoring, I very early in the Turks and Caicos, it was called a Dreezy was the GIS software. This is like way back. I don't even want to age myself, but you know, over 20 something years ago, that was the initial software I used to map and monitor coral reefs. And it was really useful to me. And then I went to Barbados. I got my master's at the University of the West Indies. The year after that, I went to do a master's degree. And then when I was in exchange for that master's, I had to work for the university. Um, for the scholarship because I had a scholarship. And so as part of this scholarship, I had to do dive surveys, environmental impact assessments for the government of Barbados and the university. And they were not using GIS. And I, I was just started getting into that. So I integrated um, our reef mapping surveys in Barbados, which have been going on for 35 years at that point, and started spatialized mapping them. And so I really got into the integration of mapping with this environmental monitoring, you know, but it was really expensive and it was really hard in the Caribbean because we didn't have big money to buy satellite imagery or the satellite imagery that existed for the islands was really blurry or under clouds. And so there was always this kind of like, this could be potentially great, but we're not quite there. This is where we start to really see how innovative thinking can help clear some of the hurdles facing Caribbean researchers. The FAA estimates that some 10,000 commercial drones will be flying in the nation's skies within five years. As more and more drones take to our skies, Congress has ordered the FAA to come up with rules to fully integrate drones into the nation's airspace by 2015. So in 2015, when commercial drones started getting hot, my, both my brothers are photographers. One's a YouTuber, one's a surf photographer. I'm like, you know, nerdy scientist. I wasn't a gamer. I wasn't into tech. But all three of us at the same time, when those drones came out, realized ways we could start using drones. And for me, I heard that you could put this thing up and you could get pictures and you could actually be creating maps in real time. And I thought this, we've been paying people big money to do this in remote sensing. I've been doing this over the years, for, at that point, about 10 or 15 years with government agencies hiring planes to collect the data and it would take months and half a million dollars. And I thought, this is too good to be true. So at that point, we grabbed onto this technology. I quickly learned it, um, became one of the first 750 women in America to get my commercial drone license back in 2015, 2016, right as soon as the industry opened and learned and got my first job actually training people in the Caribbean that year. Um, the Nature Conservancy trained me to do the environmental mapping and become a trainer of trainers. So I actually launched my first drone training class in 2016 for the government of Antigua and Barbuda. Introducing drones to the GIS mapping process in the Caribbean was a real game changer, especially because it increased accessibility and created additional avenues for community involvement in the research process, something Kim prioritizes in her research. Participatory GIS, or even a participatory approach in general to environmental management, is definitely something that is probably the core of where my passion is. Yes, you're getting people to participate in, say, let's say, participatory mapping or participatory research because you want to get better information product, right? The more people we get together. But really, the most important thing for participatory GIS to me is the process. It is the way that we engage people. For example, here, let's talk about, let's say, the Grenadines for my PhD. We mapped all the fishing grounds of the Grenadines. I could have gone through and tried to talk to fishermen and mapped certain areas. Instead, I hired the fishermen to work with me and dive the grounds with me. So that, yes, we're getting better information because they're going down dive by dive and being able to tell me what kind of fishing is happening, the quality of the ground, et cetera. But to me, the secondary benefit, which I think is probably the primary, is by involving them in the process they are learning. They're learning about their environment. They're learning about science. They're learning about how their local knowledge is actually very important. She's not kidding about that last bit, though. 
I learn every single project, every single person I work with about how they view the environment. And maybe what they're telling me is not even true at all, let's say in science. It's a bunch of you know what. But we need to know that as environmental managers because we need to know how to, um, you know, deal with misinformation or, you know, people's perceptions. And you know what? There's been times where communities have told me stuff. I think, yeah, right. And then I find out five years later in science that actually those fishermen were right. You know, an example about lobsters following each other down a line to the bank to the deep water. And I mean, they told me that for years in the Grenadines. And I saw a publication just last year talking about how this is a fact now. So it's amazing. And the participatory, the process to me is more important than the product and, and, and the stakeholder engagement and, and ensuring that things are fair and equitable and, and creating information that's not just for scientists, but you really, it's all about the audience. So you need to go back to who are the end users. And so it's stakeholder demand driven information. So you find out what their needs are, what their capacity is, what their view of the world is, and then you create information that is understandable and usable for those people rather than vice versa. We're scientists. This is the information we need. So, so it's sort of this, you take the, the approach and you flip it on its bottom or upside. And it's, that's why they call it a bottom up approach. It's an approach perfected over the course of more than a decade having been developed for use in Kim's own research. My PhD um, was develop the development across a transboundary area. So it was St. Vincent and the Grenadines in Grenada. And we created this massive marine GIS database of all the habitats, all the space uses, all the livelihoods, the problems, the issues, the resources. So there was, in terms of GIS, there's different layers or types of information. We had over 80 layers of information. Over 60% of it was created based on local knowledge and information. It took six years to do this. And over a thousand people in nine inhabited islands, plus the two mainlands worked with me on this. So this was a massive undertaking, obviously my PhD. So I kind of came up with this methodology approach. After that, um, we developed a marine spatial plan for the Grenadines using that information. And then I went out and I did the same thing again and again for the mainland of St. Vincent. I've done it in Barbados. I've done it in Trinidad and Tobago. I've done it in Jamaica. So I did this again and again, and I started really refining this methodology and approach and have really made it into a very quick and easy way that we can train people and we can use it to fill information gaps and sort of collate all the existing information. And so, like I said, just moving it on with the drones, it's the same approach I've been doing for the last 15 years. I've just refined it even more with using drone technology. Kim has been working hard these days, teaching others how to use her methodology. So I train government agencies, nonprofit groups, researchers, regular people, how to use a participatory, I call it UAS approach, but it's a, a drone slash geospatial approach. I'm training people how to use, fly the drones, collect their own data, but also how to analyze the data, how to use it for participatory mapping, as well as how to share it, how to share it depending on the audience, whether it's multimedia via WhatsApp, web maps, data. So again, you really have to go back to the audience, the, the, the end user, and determine what data and information do they need. But I teach people the whole process so that they can retool this, whether it's for climate change or disasters or agriculture. It's, it's the same sort of approach. And I'm teaching them the critical thinking skills that they need so that they can retool this any which way that they need. Kim's work goes a long way towards demonstrating the widespread utility of drone tech, which hasn't always had the best reputation. For weeks, people living in parts of Colorado and Nebraska have seen mysterious drones flying near their homes. Well, now those residents are getting a bit uneasy. Today, we're looking into the specifics of drone pilots' rights, as well as the rights of the people around them. Drone debate comes to the state capitol. Do the high-tech flyers invade our privacy? At least one California legislator thinks so. It says we need a law to stop them. A few years ago with drones, people were very nervous because they were worried about privacy and this and that. And I was actually just speaking to a student group on Friday and explaining to them that actually that has really changed dramatically in the last 
three to five years in the Caribbean. Um, Barbados, where I'm from, we have a ban that's now being lifted. A lot of the countries now are getting their policies in place. And the average person isn't so skeptical. The average person is getting more excited when they see drone technology and and they're understanding it's not just this stupid little toy. It's actually a very useful tool that makes our job safer and more effective and efficient. Kim's community-centered approach has the potential to help tackle a wide array of issues for all kinds of people. And this hasn't gone unnoticed. It's definitely spreading. Um, I would say when I did my PhD, when I started it, which was like back in 2005, 2006, and I, like I said, I went to about 2012, then we did the MSP the next two years after that. It started growing a lot more. I got really into participatory GIS. It was not being heavily used in the Caribbean, especially or in the marine environment. It's been, it actually has its roots from Africa and agricultural systems. So in recent years, with the advent of sustainable development, the blue economy, marine spatial planning, all these buzzwords that we're hearing, um, having participatory um, research and inclusion of stakeholders and multi-knowledge information, transparency, participatory GIS is underpinned by those governance, good governance principles, you know, which is why it's always been so close to my heart, because I do believe that that is the key to uh, effective environmental management. We do need to incorporate and bring in social and economic needs. Even if we only solve 50% of the conservation problem, you know, if we don't have that buy-in socially and economically, we're not going to get that far. And this isn't Kim simply expressing her opinion. Remember, she's a researcher. That's what my PhD was like a hard science where we did, you know, conventional science and local knowledge and we cross validated. And we found that once you have the trust and build those social partnerships, those people, 89% accurate was what we found their local knowledge was. But again, you can't just go in there quick. It's a longer term capacity building approach. And that's where I kind of butt head sometime with funding agencies that tell you they want something done like this in six months. You know, it's this is something that's hard too with governments and ministries because they're flipping and they're switching. It's like they're trying to get these agencies, and I will give the United Nations FAO huge credit because they have let me in the last few years develop a longer term approach and course where I could slowly build that capacity and actually get a team of people that are capable. Um, and that's really you know, rewarding to me is that longer term. I don't want to just go in quick and dirty. It's to me, that's not even worth it. This reminds us that there are some issues that need to be addressed directly for an approach like this to work efficiently. First of all, the Caribbean context in general is not super pro sharing and open access of data which is a shame because it has been scientifically shown many places over, especially in the participatory GIS world, that by collaborating and sharing data is much more powerful. The sum of the parts is much more powerful than each piece on its own. And um, just trying to get through on that level, that open access to data is what holds us back in the Caribbean. Now, this is a principle near and dear to our hearts here at CISO. Although, as Kim points out, we can't really be one-sided when considering an issue like this. You need to be careful in participatory GIS because data is power. It can be disempowering to people to have information as well. You can hurt the people that you gave the data to, you know. Um, So there's ethical considerations you really need to think about in terms of data. While we're on the topic of data, we may want to consider the massive amount of it being collected and processed in Kim's line of work. Which brings us to another challenging issue. Finances, I think, is a big one. Financial challenges, but also technological challenges. And if we talk about data and information, GIS, drones, um, in order to have this stuff going and working on national and regional levels, we need to have storage space, right? We need to have remote servers. We need to have high-powered computers. We need to have centralized databases and sharing portals. Every time I fly a drone, I'm probably collecting up to 10 gigs of data per day. Now, you've got a team of people out there flying, like in St. Lucia. They, they're mapping, and they're just about to complete mapping the entire agricultural lands of the entire country in less than a year. 
That is several terabytes of data that you need to have hosted and share. And then if you want to be able to have platforms to share it, I mean, you talk, think about that. So there's some of the challenges is like, we don't have this big computers and we don't have the, the, the storage space infrastructure. Of course, even with all the money and equipment in the world, there's one factor that's always going to pose its own challenges. The other challenge that the Caribbean has is our environment. We have rough environments, let's say for drone flying. Um, it's windy, it's humid. Um, we are, have a lot of areas in different islands that have no data. It's off the grid, right? You know, so it, the accessibility, um, the, the rugged terrains. You know, in Dominica, I was working with farmers there. They're they're farming up on the cloud forests, up on the tops of the mountains, you know, and, and very hard to get to places. Yeah, the Caribbean doesn't always present the most straightforward operating conditions, especially when you consider the coastal environments that are often being mapped. And this is something Kim is actually trying to address directly. One of the new training courses I am going to be launching this year is a participatory UAS, so drone and geospatial approach to using drones for the blue economy and marine spatial planning in the Caribbean. Okay, I know that was a lot, but Kim can explain. You know, mapping reefs and mapping coastal areas is much different than mapping the land um, terrestrial areas. One, because when you are mapping, um, you're taking hundreds of pictures and then the drone software has to stitch together these pictures into one map. And so it needs certain points on each picture to snap together. They're called key points or stitch all the pictures into the, the map. Now, when you're going over water, water A is very homogeneous. A lot of times, especially if there's glistening and glare on the water, everything looks the same. Um, so there's a lot, it can be rough if there's winds and things move like boats or, and, and so it's kind of harder to stitch. So there's a, a little unique, uh, let's say approach you need to have in terms of time and day and tide and other considerations. So I'm developing this more marine based um, participatory environmental mapping approach. And I was working in Belize for a month and in Barbados for the last month, collecting a lot of field data, collecting data to see how far offshore, just using regular um, DJI drones. At this point in time, I'm using the Air 2S. So it's a photography mapping drone, but you know, like a $1,500 drone. So just an off the shelf drone that doesn't have any special payload or any special multi-spectral camera. So it just has a regular RGB photo camera on it. And we were testing it to see how far off can we go? How deep can we read reefs and seagrasses and mangroves? And so basically I've been compiling a whole portfolio of the various ways drones can be used for marine spatial planning and to support the blue economy, whether it's offshore um, wind energy or using it for, for climate change, disaster management, you know, mapping critical areas, livelihoods, marine, you know, parks, surveillance, enforcement. So I'm going to be presenting this whole portfolio um, of the ways that it could potentially be used. The goal here at the end of the day is to empower those who want to take action in their communities. And people do. The more I talk to my friends and family and people I know around the world, the average person's really interested in how they can help. So I think public participation, finding ways to engage people, um, to work with local communities, to have early warning network systems. A lot of the stuff I do with this participatory, it's the process. It's getting the community members to know who in government to call to when there's a problem and vice versa, who in government who to talk to down on the ground and getting those foot soldiers out there and, and building the social networks we need to be effective. And, you know, we have the brains, we've got people that are trained. We need the connectors. We need social scientists. We need people that can deal with people. People skills are so under like represented in science so, you know, I think you need to realize if you want to be a scientist, you don't have to be in a lab coat. You don't have to be some nerd. You could just be good with people. You could be good with videos and, and storytelling, whether you're a drone photographer or you're a scientist doing field surveys using the drone data. You could be a fisherman and, and, and doing your job, but just be one of those foot soldiers that, you know, calls the, the right people when it needs to be done. 
It's important to remember that there is a wide range of ways to tackle the many issues affecting our shared environment. In fact, some would say it's crucial. I think we've realized as scientists or government agencies, I work a lot with government agencies, that we can't do this all on our own anymore. Um, I think there was an approach, and as well as we can't just take a scientific approach. We've got to use a wider approach incorporating social, economic um, needs. And again, that's where blue economy changes a little bit from sustainable development. It's how can we get, let's say, private investors and alternative blue bonds and these other funding schemes to support um, sustainable development. I think by teaching people and showing people the role that they can and should be playing in terms of environmental management is extremely important. And so again, me, I believe that by building everybody's capacity to use technology and use off the shelf mobile apps and tools such as drones, web maps, that, that we can all play a role. It's all a matter of unconventional thinking which, as Kim points out, is an almost natural part of working in the Caribbean. The reason why I think I love going to school there and working in the Caribbean is it teaches us to think out of the box. We are more resilient. We are not used to this turnkey solution because we don't have the money or we don't have the skills. We don't have the tech, you know, and I won awards doing my PhD because I created things. I created an underwater ROV by buying a $1,500 this drop camera and then worked with fishermen to build a PVC frame and weights. And we ended up mapping the entire Grenada bank off like a $2,000 piece of equipment because we couldn't afford the $30,000 ROV. So little things like that, that's why I love. And I tell the students that I work with in, and all my students, whether the university or not in the Caribbean, take it as a, a strength, not as a challenge, use it as a way to grow. The environmental problems facing us in the Caribbean are seldom straightforward, especially since we tend not to have ready access to the kinds of resources found in more industrialized nations. But if we can think creatively, embrace new technology, and truly act as a community, we can always develop effective new solutions. Anyway, that's all we have for you on this episode of Caesar Voices. We'd like to thank our guest, Dr. Kim Baldwin, for taking the time to share her insights with us. We'd also like to thank our funded partners, the Barbados Environment Conservation Trust, or BECT, and the Caribbean Center for Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency, or CECRE, for making this episode possible. BECT aims to help Barbados reach its national development goals by supporting local initiatives aimed at environmental sustainability while CECRE promotes renewable energy and energy efficiency investments, markets, and industries in the Caribbean. Of course, we'd also like to thank our listeners for tuning in to the Seas of Voices podcast. If you like what you've been hearing so far, please feel free to give us a rating wherever you're listening. We'd also like to remind you that you can visit our website, caesarjournal.org slash donations to lend your financial support or join our monthly donor club on Patreon and gain access to exclusive content, or even be featured in an episode of our podcast, just click the links in the description. And if you'd like to sponsor an episode of Caesar Voices and feature your company or NGO, please click on our corporate link to learn more. <laughs>